Exhibit 59. That should be 49. Excuse me, 49. Uh, our shotgun pellets from the left shoulder. See what's written on number 50. Doesn't have anything. Yes, and number 50, there they are. Those are number 50, uh, are also shotgun pellets. And number 48 is the ring from Mr. Ensel. So the Shotgun wounds that he had, if he would have gotten medical attention, would he have survived those wounds? No. Why do you say that? What kind of damage internally happened? The, uh, the, the injury to the head was absolutely devastating. The injury to the shoulder, of course, would that would have been survivable, but and um, the injury to the back of the head behind the left ear was completely devastating. It caused multiple fractures in the skull, and it, um, uh, as I say, severely injured the brain. And the injury to the left side of the head by itself, the continuation of the uh, injury to the left arm and shoulder, that would have probably been lethal b despite medical attention. and. Uh, if, it, if it wasn't lethal, it would have left him neurologically disabled for a very long time. Was there a way to tell if Chad died before or after the fire began? Well, he um, he did not. He he died after the fire, or died as the fire was starting. Because had he died when the fire was in progress, he would have inhaled smoke, and uh, we've been able to detect soot in his airway. The same soot that was on his body would have been in his bronchial tubes and his windpipe and did not find any of that. Did you order any labs or other tests to be done in conjunction with your autopsy? Yes, we did some toxicology studies. And what's the purpose of those? Um, it um, detects uh, whether the person was under the influence of any drugs or alcohol at the time they died. And we also attempted to test for carbon monoxide, but our because of the decay process, we could not get an adequate sample. Does the fact that the body was decomposing, would that affect any of the results for the um, drug or alcohol testing? Uh, it, it would affect an alcohol. In, in other words, it, it as a body decomposes, it tends to produce alcohol because there are bacteria and fungal organisms that begin to break down the body and they will produce alcohol. So you will get alcohol uh, in the blood uh, in a body that is decaying. Uh, drugs, uh, you wouldn't necessarily get an accurate level, but if a drug was there, you'd probably find it. So what were the results of those toxicology tests? Uh, well, the uh, blood alcohol was 0 0.609%. 0 0.609? 0 0.06, excuse me, 0 0.069. Okay. I'm sorry I said that. No, that's okay. Um, and the legal limit's 0 0.08, right, just for comparison? For driving purposes, yes. All right. And so do you know if he had had any alcohol prior to death? Or if I, that I wouldn't be able to tell you because of the decay. All right. So that didn't really help you in your assessment as to your autopsy, correct? Correct. Was there any evidence of chronic alcohol use or abuse? No, there wasn't. At the conclusion of the autopsy, did you form an opinion as to cause of death? Yes. And what was that opinion? This was the uh, shotgun wounds to the head. I have nothing further, Your Honor. I have no questions for Dr. Masala. Thank you for your testimony. Can you be excused? I would request that, Your Honor. No, Judge. 
Okay. Uh, you cannot discuss your testimony with anyone else who may be participating in the proceeding until the case is closed. Thank you. All right, so that wraps up our coverage of this trial for the day. As you just heard there, Dr. Masello telling the court that in his estimation, it was the gunshot wounds to the head that killed this victim. The other interesting thing you talked about was the blood alcohol level, 0 0.069, just a little bit below the legal limit, which was 0 0.08. But it really had no bearing on whether he had alcohol before he was killed because of the alcohol production in the body in the decomposition process. So not a lot to be taken away from that. All right, let me welcome in my guest for this hour. Trial attorney Wendy Patrick has been standing by patiently. Truly appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining me tonight on the show. And I um, want to talk a little bit first about the medical examiner's testimony. I thought it was interesting uh, during the coroner's testimony that initially uh, someone on the phone who, hadn't, who wasn't at the scene thought that this might be, uh, it sounded like to them, a suicide. And they said, well, let's just sign it off that way. Of course, uh, cooler heads prevailed, and they ultimately did the autopsy, finding it was gunshot wounds. But what do you take away from the county coroner's testimony? I, you know, I think it's really important to a jury to hear exactly what each member in the process does. You know, you hear these fancy names, medical examiner, coroner, investigator, lead detective. But to really break it down for a jury, to let them know what role each one of these witnesses played in the process is going to be very important. Because remember, their conclusions are only as good as the foundations that are laid during these examinations we've seen today. And it was a great day for the prosecution. I mean, they are right out of the gate really establishing many of the types of pieces of evidence they're going to need to have that foundation. You know, in the opening statement, you heard the prosecutor talk about, well, the jury's going to have to establish the timeline. The prosecution team is establishing the timeline very well here, and that's going to help this jury decide what weight to give to the coroner's testimony and how to make sure that they don't interpret too much in terms of the conclusions they can reach based on which, which one of these witnesses did what in the process. Fair enough. And that's what, that leads me to my next question, because one of the things that one of my takeaways from the county coroner and medical examiner's testimony was that neither, neither one of them, because of decomposition, could really pinpoint the time of death. Um, if you're a defense attorney, that may be something you can put in your arsenal. Again, it's all about muddying the waters, creating some doubt. Do you think that's going to be an important point, the fact that they couldn't pinpoint the time of death? I don't know that in the, in the mix of the facts uh, as this case progresses that it's going to be that big of a deal. Because remember, when you're talking about is it a suicide or is it a homicide, there's much more to the analysis than time of death. More likely, there is going to be a very good argument that a suicide could not have been attempted or completed with these two gunshot wounds. Not to mention the fact that nobody seemed to have seen any signs that Chad was suicidal. So there's a very common sense aspect to a fact pattern like this that distinguishes it from others. And I mean, we haven't even talked about the adultery, the motive, and all the rest of the, the facts and circumstances that this jury is going to have to consider. But from a forensic angle, uh, yes, it gives the defense something to work with. But in, in, at the end of the day, they'll need to carry that across the finish line in terms of arguing that somehow it establishes reasonable doubt. Uh, and although I know, you know, first day you can't really make predictions, but that's an uphill battle. Yeah, I would have to agree with you. I think at the end of the day, when you get the totality of the circumstances, that's going to be a non-issue. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting this afternoon, what we were showing our viewers, mom and the sister took the stand. Now, they didn't push the case forward in terms of uh, the elements of the case, but I thought they were extremely important in establishing or at least preemptive strikes to what maybe the anticipated defense might be based on statements made by Nikki Ensel regarding uh, possible abuse and possible drinking issues in the house. And they both made clear, at least to me, that those were not really issues for their son and brother. That's right. And it's important to learn about the family dynamics through members of the family. Now, it's true. You and I and our viewers have all seen cases where the red flags were hard to detect, where somebody was able to keep up a good front and nobody really knew how the couple related to each other. This doesn't appear to be one of those cases. Nonetheless, I mean, the family seemed to be very forthcoming and, and transparent about the issues. I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect relationship. But that's not what this trial is about, whether or not this couple had a perfect relationship. It's about whether or not this defendant is guilty of murder. And to that end, every bit that we can learn about this couple uh, is important. 
But it's also important that we learn about the fact that there's already a co-conspirator who's pled guilty. Now, of course, it remains to be seen what role, if any, he's going to have during the course of this trial. But the fact pattern is very different. It's not a battered women syndrome defense, yeah. as far as I can tell. So while it is important that the family dynamics come into play, the weight that this jury is going to give those dynamics is, of course, complicated by the fact that that's not really uh, the gist of where we believe the defense is going to go. Fair enough. But there is a possibility that this may somehow shape into a self-defense kind of thing. I, I don't know. It's out there. So we'll have to see how that plays.